It's 2022 and once again Scott Drew's Baylor Bears are on top of the college basketball world. The Bears have been impressive in wins over Michigan State, Villanova, and Iowa State and currently ranks top 12 nationally in both offensive and defensive efficiency and with smooth shooting guards, long athletic wings, and energetic bigs, Baylor is certainly poised to have a lot of success this year. Just how much though? That remains to be seen. If the last 15 years have taught us anything, it's that it's extremely difficult to repeat as champions in college basketball, and Baylor is attempting to accomplish what would be a Herculean feat. On top of those disheartening odds, Baylor lost four starters from its title team last year, among those a lottery pick, a Final Four most outstanding player, and two fifth-year seniors, but it still seems that the Bears truly have a team worthy of championship contention yet again. Let's take a look at this year's Baylor squad and see just how good those chances are. This is the sequel. It's hard to follow up a championship season. Just ask the 2013 Kentucky Wildcats that had their season end at the hand of Robert Morris in the first round of the NIT. There have, of course, been success stories too, albeit less frequent. The 2007 Florida Gators and the 1992 Duke Blue Devils are prominent examples, but those two teams were in much more favorable situations than this year's version of Baylor. 1992 Duke returned Christian Leitner, Grant Hill, and Bobby Hurley, while 2007 Florida returned Joakim Noah, Al Horford, and Corey Brewer. Baylor didn't have the luxury of returning their three best players. Davion Mitchell, Jared Butler, and Macy Oteague all decided to leave for the NBA, and in Mark Vital's case, the NFL. So Baylor is attempting to recreate last year's magic with an altered cast of characters, and while the contributions of Adam Flagler, Matthew Meyer, Jonathan Chimo Chachua, and Flo Thamba shouldn't go unnoticed, it's four new players for Baylor that has really put this team over the top. Adding new characters to a movie is a difficult situation. While they can absolutely raise the franchise's ceiling, think Puss in Boots and Shrek 2, they can also totally derail what made the original so great in the first place. Think Mel Gibson and Daddy's Home 2. A key part of Baylor's success this year is that they've hit home runs with their offseason additions. Let's start with James Akinjo. On his third school of his career, James Akinjo is a point of attack guard with a blisteringly quick first step and terrific change of pace. Remind you of anyone? He's currently averaging around 14.5 points and 6 assists per game while hitting close to 43% of his threes this season. Akinjo thrives when he's able to probe to paint and create advantages. He's slippery and bounces off defenders on the ground with ease. Watch the change of pace from Akinjo here. Speeding up, slowing down, and then speeding up again leaving Kendall Brown for a wide open dunk. Here, Akinja will snake a ball screen with a hostage dribble and then glide through the lane for a nice lefty finish. And here, Akinjo uses his quickness to reject the ball screen and find Kendall Brown for the alley-oop dunk. The advantages Akinjo creates with his savvy play allows guys like LJ Cryer to get more chances to succeed. Cryer was on the team last year, but he saw very little action as a freshman, so I'm including him as a newcomer in this section. He's kind of like Frazier Crane. He wasn't the superstar of Cheers, but he ended up moving to Seattle and being the star of his own show, Frazier. Thank God they switched seats, but that could be me down there. Poor Niles. What do you mean? Every guy dreams of a chance like this. Dream or not, Dad, eventually he's going to try to take that shot. You know how Niles throws? Yeah, and you're Pete Maravich. I don't know what that means. Unlike Dr. Crane, though, Cryer didn't have to move anywhere. He stayed in Waco and is now the second leading scorer on the nation's top team. Shooting around 46.5% from three on five and a half attempts per game, Cryer is just a pure flamethrower. And part of the reason why he makes defenses pay is because he's such a threat both on and off the ball. Here, Baylor will use a floppy action for LJ Cryer. He'll come off screens along the baseline and then he'll rise and fire off the catch for an open three. His shooting, along with his herky-jerky style, keeps defenses off balance too. Watch here how he uses a subtle eye fake to get his defender in the air, giving him a wide open reverse layup. For most players, this is a traditional right-handed layup, but Cryer's patience and savviness with the ball allows him to get an even more open look. With guys like Akinjo and Cryer on the floor, the defense must give them attention, which opens things up for a guy like Kendall Brown. Brown's a unique talent. A five-star prospect from Minnesota, he best projects as a playmaking defensive wing with tremendous athleticism. His shot profile so far for Baylor has been pretty interesting. Brown is shooting close to 70% from the floor primarily because he uses that quickness and athleticism extremely well as a cutter and play finisher. We've seen this play before, but instead of watching James Akinjo, watch the cut Kendall Brown puts on his man. This is an elite jab step that gives him a wide open dunk. 
in here, watch how he waits for Gabe Brown to commit to Flagler before he cuts, and then that's just a ridiculous layup. His off-ball feel also translates on the ball. While his handle isn't super polished yet, Brown has consistently shown high-level passing vision during his time at Baylor. This live dribble pass is an absolute dime. And here, watch him attack the closeout, be controlled enough in the lane to not get called for a charge, and then find an open LJ Cryer. He's also a disruptor on defense, and this is where Baylor kind of differs from last year, perhaps in a better way. Thanks to guys like Brown and Jeremy Sohan, they're longer and cover more ground defensively. Let's talk Jeremy Sohan. The freshman from Great Britain is a 6'9", 230-pound wing with some of the most colorful hair in college basketball. Averaging around 8.6 rebounds and 2 assists off the bench, Sohan has found several ways to be impactful for Baylor. Watch Sohan's relentless ball pressure here, and while he gets caught in the air, he still manages to block the shot. While he wasn't the most heralded recruit coming into Baylor, he's proven his worth as another active defender and timely offensive weapon. While this isn't a typical play from Sohan, watch how he uses his strong frame to create space and then rise for the turnaround jumper. That's impressive stuff. The addition of these four, combined with the scoring of Adam Flagler and Matthew Meyer, and the energy and size of Flo Thamba and Jonathan Chamo Chachua, have Baylor right in the thick of another title chase. As a team, Baylor once again defends at an extremely high level. They rotate well, they stick to schematic principles, and give great effort while also being extremely disciplined. Watch this beauty of a defensive possession. It'll first start off with Baylor's guards hounding Colin Gillespie on the perimeter. Baylor communicates the switch well on top, Here's Kendall Brown guarding the ball and again providing that relentless ball pressure. And finally, it's Flo Thamba's time to finish out the possession, forcing the Eric Dixon turnover. They're also super aware defensively. Watch how Flagler blows up this post entry, leading to a fast break layup for Kendall Brown. At the same time, there have been some troubling lapses and breakdowns, especially when trying to aggressively contain the drive. Here, Meyer will get displaced on a screen, forcing Jonathan Chamo Chachua to help, leaving a wide open roll man for Iowa State. And here is just a simple overplay from Jeremy Sohan. He's too aggressive trying to tip this pass, which leaves a wide open Jacob Groves for a layup. While they don't have the individual creation from a year ago, Baylor has found different ways to score with their passing. Last year, they could do a lot of matchup hunting. Here's Davion Mitchell putting Aaron Cook in a blender. And here's Jared Butler taking Corey Kispert to school. And here's Macy Oteague just torturing Drew Timmy. But this year, it's Baylor's movement, both on and off the ball, that is helping them score at a nationally elite level. Around 60% of Baylor's baskets have been assisted, which is about a 5% increase from last year. While 2021 Baylor wasn't averse to moving the ball, this year's team has made it even more of an offensive staple. And while they're performing around 5 points worse offensively per 100 possessions, it's still good enough to be top 10 nationally. While I wouldn't say this year's Baylor team is better than last year's version, and frankly I wouldn't consider many teams in the history of college basketball to be better than 2021 Baylor, at the end of the day, this Baylor squad is really, really good. And the sequel still has a decent chance to have just as good of an ending as the original. Let me know what you think below, and as always, thanks for watching.